Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Gina Dent, and um, I couldn't be more thrilled to be with all of you and these incredible people beside me at this time. Um, I would love to thank the students from JVP and SJP one more time. Thank you for the work you've been doing. Uh, thank you for uh, working in the tradition of many who were educated at this institution, including Barbara Ransby, and who have struggled uh, for this cause and many others for many years. I have to say I'm, I'm stunned um, as someone who did her PhD at this institution. I came to this institution to study with Edward Said in 1989 and uh, to be a part of the nascent field of post-colonial studies. And it is astonishing to me that one of the most honored individuals from this university is being uh, treated this way uh, in his death. The idea that Columbia is not at the center of the struggle for free Palestine is incredible to me. Um, before I go further, because I feel myself about to make a speech, but I won't, <laughs> um, I, I, I want to uh, introduce very briefly to you the incredible people I have next to me. Uh, Robin D.G. Kelly is an... <laughs> um, you know, these are friends, comrades, colleagues, dear ones. Uh, I think we all know them. Uh, Robin D.G. Kelly uh, literally runs from place to place uh, <laughs> to do this work. Uh, he is, as we all know, a prolific writer and thinker, but he has also been steadfast in his dedication to the movement uh, and to the struggles of all peoples. Deo Gore is known to us for the incredible work in recovering black radical feminist histories. Uh, and of course, also through uh, various organizing in many causes. Um, we are uh, beholden uh, to Deo for uh, the kind of work that we are all honoring in this symposium through our, um, for the incredible people we are honoring together, uh, both Ella Baker and Barbara Ransby. And of course, Deo Gore comes in that tradition. And uh, finally, last but very much not least, Mariam Kaba. Uh, I actually don't know what where, where is Waldo really actually means, but um, I feel like um, everywhere I look, Mariam's popping up, um, uh, has, uh, is a prolific author, activist, artist, curator, um, scholar, uh, tour guide, um, uh, and uh, oh so many other things and um, has been a beacon uh, for those of us in the abolitionist movement. So thank you all for being here and for joining me. Um, I will let them speak because that's what we're here for, but I, I wanna say that I, um, uh, of course all of us accepted this invitation and we really couldn't do anything except clear our calendars because we're asked to honor um, both Ella Baker and Barbara Ransby. And I wanna say that um, Barbara, I've been involved with Barbara and causes from, I don't know, the early 90s, I suppose. Um, but what I'm thinking about most now is that Barbara was one of the organizers of a delegation 
of indigenous and women of color feminists to Palestine in 2011, which I joined. Uh, there are several members here from that delegation, Pramila, Beverly Guy Sheftal, Angela Davis, anyone else? Chandra Malanti. Where is Chandra? There you are. Um, and um, that is the only experience I have had in traveling to that region. Um, and it's quite unbelievable to me to realize how much uh, what we observed and experienced during that time um, is even more urgent now and has not at all shifted. Uh, I am so thrilled to be with people who both pay tribute to black feminist histories, to radical organizing, to internationalism, but who also will not forget in this moment to acknowledge where we are and what we're all experiencing and what we need to do. So I am thinking about all of the people who guided us uh, during that time. I'm thinking in particular about Adamir, um, a human rights organization that works um, with cause of the prisoners um, in uh, Israel, Palestine. And um, that organization has, since we were there, been declared a terrorist organization, as have many of the organizations um, that we met with during that time. And we all often talk about the way that Nelson Mandela was treated as a terrorist. Um, and I often have to remind people that the label terrorist has been used to try to prevent us from recognizing what truly needs to be done to transform this world. And I am so very thrilled to be with a group of people who are defying the categorization and insisting on building a more just world. So in that spirit, I'm gonna turn the microphone to Robin D.G. Kelly. That's how it's listed, I did not think you can use whatever you like. I'm sorry, I prepared something. Um, <laughs> on, on the plane, I won't lie, on the plane, but I, but I, but somebody I've been thinking about for a long, long time. So before I begin, and I know I have ten minutes, um, and I'll, I may stop in the middle just to make sure I keep in time. Um, I'm, I'm looking out at the audience. It's like my whole life is flashing before me. <laughs> it's like my whole life, everybody. Um, and of course, you know, I was here teaching for a few years at a time when uh, Middle East studies was being attacked. And we had a lot of the same debates and conversations, again, about donors, you know, because that's really fundamental what this is about. Um, but I'm looking at Barbara Ransby, uh, my friend for more than 30 years. And, you know, I had the pleasure of being on her dissertation committee. Um, and by the way, by half, half of you in here, I've been on your dissertation committee. <laughs> you know that's true. You know that's true. But that dissertation was special. I mean, Bar Barbara wrote a book that everyone knew would be groundbreaking at the time, you know, before it even came out. So let me just say what I'm going to say. I'm going to connect this to the Palestine. I mean, we can probably answer the question about what would Ella Baker do now? It may be a pretty easy answer in the face of the escalation of genocidal war. At the same time, you know, we don't really have a record. Barbara probably has a record of uh, Baker's response to say 1948 or 1967, two really crucial historical moments. But what, what I want to do with the little time I have is kind of, and I'm a historian, so I think like historians, I want to do is sort of link um, in a schematic way uh, Baker's praxis and ideas with radical women and women of color active in the struggle to free Palestine. So for example, we don't, we do know that from Barbara's work, that Ella Baker remained close to SNCC, its leaders often coming, uh, coming to her for advice. Uh, well into 1967, that's the year that uh, SNCC uh, released or published Third World Roundup, Palestine Problem, Test Your Knowledge uh, in its newsletter, which wasn't supposed to be released. It was actually a working, uh, internal working paper. And that paper 
uh, describe Israel as a colonial state backed by U.S. imperialism and Palestinians as victims of racial sub subjugation. And in short, black identification with Zionism um, as a striving, uh, black identification with Zionism, you know, uh, as a striving for land and self-determination gave way to a radical critique of Zionism as a form of settler colonialism akin to American racism and South African apartheid. Uh, now, what we do know is that the primary author of that document was SNCC Communications Director Ethel Miner, uh, who just transitioned last year. Um, she wrote most of it, presumably, with Kwame Tereb, I think he wrote all of it. And a part of it comes from the Palestine Research Center's uh, uh, pamphlet, Do You Know, 20 Basic Facts About the Palestine Problem. Um, and Kwame Ture credits her, he doesn't mention her by name, in his memoir, but he credits her with drafting a document, but not just that, but by bringing the question of Palestine uh, to SNCC in the first place. Uh, he says, he calls her one courageous activist sister, you know, that and the organization's position with respect to Palestine had everything to do with the study group that she had started back in 1965, soon after Malcolm was assassinated. Um, and they had read everything. They'd read Theodore Herzl. They read Zionist literature. They read anti-Zionist literature. Um, they read history. Now, who is Ethel Miner? She was born in 1938 in Chicago, which is clearly represented here <laughs> as the most important city, you know. Chicago, you know, is a red city. You know that, right? You understand that. Um, she, she graduated from the University of Illinois in 1959. Uh, she wanted to work for the United Nations, but as a black woman, that wasn't going to happen. So she went to Colombia, uh, South America, um, worked as a school teacher, became fluent in Spanish, came back. She wasn't really interested, interested in the sit-in movement, so she joined the Nation of Islam, uh, recruited by Malcolm X. She worked closely with Malcolm. She wrote for Muhammad Speaks. When Malcolm left the NOI, uh, she went with him and helped form the Organization of Afro-American Unity, and she became the secretary and office manager of that organization. I'm mentioning all this because we all need to know who Ethel Miner is. We all need to know. Um, after Malcolm's assassination, she joined SNCC, worked closely with Kwame Ture as editor and speechwriter. And then in 1967, she was appointed director of communications, replacing Charlie, Charlie Cobb. Um, and she was responsible for dealing with the press during SNCC's most controversial Virtual period. This is a period with, within a year. They took a stand against the Vietnam War and took a stand in defense of Palest Palestinian liberation. Um, and she, under her leadership, they launched Afro American News Service, uh, nationwide news distribution center dealing with black media. And she studied and fought for Palestine liberation, uh, Palestine's liberation before, uh, uh, you know, in, oh, I was saying, shouldn't before, but because. She was an internationalist. And there's lots more to her story. She went to Guinea. Um, she was at Howard University, a real central figure in the Pan-African movement there. But I do want to mention one thing. At Howard University in 1972, uh, she gives a speech which shows that she is, is in the mold of Ella Baker. And in this speech, she's very frustrated with black people looking for a what? Charismatic leader, a messiah. And she says, we don't need a personality like a Jesse Jackson or a Farrakhan, but grassroots organization, now I'm paraphrasing, grassroots organization instead committed to fighting for structural, fighting against structural oppression at all levels. And in her words, she says, no, people are easily disillusioned. If people don't see a structured organizer or leader at rallies, they feel nothing is going on. And she's saying there's a lot going on. Um, anyway, Minor took the brunt of the blowback for that article. I'm not going to say much about it, except for the fact that um, SNCC got way more uh, pushback for the position on Palestine than he did on Vietnam, way more. I mean, you got members of Congress saying that they're working with Arab embassies, and therefore they should register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, they should lose their tax-exempt status. Um, they called for an investigation into SNCC's ties to Arab nations. Uh, it was denounced by people that we love. Harry Belafonte denounced SNCC, uh, A. Philip Randolph, and Bayard Rustin, who, you know, you're reading this, you're watching this amazing um, biopic, but Bayard Rustin was very, very much a Zionist, okay? We just have to be honest about that. 
Um, and they actually put out a, doc, a statement adding that the state, that the document that Ethel Miner wrote, quote, reflects a complete divorce from the opinions and aspirations of the mass of American Negroes. Um, and, you know, and most, what's most telling is that people actually blame communism. <laughs> it's with communist influence, you know, more so than the Arabs. In any case, um, uh, just to jump forward, I'm going to skip over some stuff because I want to get to the very, very end. Um, there, uh, a number of black women, black feminists, had taken a very strong stance in solidarity with Palestine. Uh, you know, when A. Philip Randolph and Byard Rustin formed Black Americans to Support Israel Committee, BASIC, in 1970, they took out this full-page ad defending Israel and appealing for more funding for Israel's military. In response, a coalition of black radicals, which included Fran Beale, co-founder of the Third World Women's Alliance, Flo Kennedy, formed the Committee of Black Americans for Truth about the Middle East and responded with their own New York Times uh, ad under the title, An Appeal by Black Americans Against United States Support of the Zionist Government of Israel. And the statement's very, very powerful. I could just paraphrase, but you should read it. It implicates the US in the slaughter of Palestinian refugees in Jordan, uh, it, which are linked to US proxy wars in Southeast Asia, South Africa, Greece, and Iran, and it situated the struggle in Palestine within a broader global anti-colonial revolution. And, and it called Israel a white settler state and compared it to South Africa and Rhodesia, uh, which we know is Zimbabwe. Throughout the 1970s, Triple Jeopardy, which was the Third World Women's Alliance uh, publication, <coughs> ran several articles about Palestine. Um, and I'm gonna skip over some stuff. But, when you, but one of the things I wanna say is that um, Triple Jeopardy is one of many, many different feminist organizations, feminist uh, publications. And of course, Angela Davis is very much central to a lot of these debates as Barbara Smith, you know, writing, taking a stance on Palestine in the 70s, right? In the 70s, this is very, very important, the timing. And so when you look at some of these, there's a couple things that are important. One. These were US radical feminists across the board, and they were not pacifists. They supported armed struggle. Um, in fact, you'd have pictures of, of Palestinian women with Kalishnikov rifles, you know, um, you know, basically taking a stand against uh, uh, occupation. And they had articles about Leila Khaled, you know, who the Palestinian militant who hijacked the plane. And she was celebrated in radical feminist organizations uh, and publications. Now you can find all these articles, not just in Triple Jeopardy, but in In I Woman, uh, uh, um, Battle Axe, Big Mama Rag, Woman News. And the themes and arguments are not very different from what we've seen over the past 10 years. In other words, what they were debating and discussing was uh, one, arguing that to be anti-Zionist is not to be anti-Semitic. That's not to say they're not anti-Zionists who, anti who are not anti-Semitic, but they're saying that that's in principle is not the case. Um, and what's interesting uh, is that they freely use the term genocide without qualification to describe Israel's war and occupation. Um, in other words, they were unpo unapologetic, uncompromising, uh, in, in very strident. So for example, the November 1st, 1987 issue of Woman News, which is a New York City um, feminist news publication, its editorial collective, which is multiracial, uh, wrote, and I quote, the genocide being carried out against the Palestinian people is not different from the genocide practices in South Africa. And this was the nature of settler colonialism, they argued. They, say, they go on to say, some white people want the land and the wealth and the people who stand in their way must be eliminated or made to serve them. Wherever the settlers come in, come from rather, they come to be oppressors. Now, of course, this is a long time ago before all the settler colonialism scholarship <laughs> came about. Just I'm saying, you don't always have to quote Patrick Wolf. You can go back to um, <laughs> some of these statements by uh, women of color feminists. Finally, the last thing I wanna say is I want to bring us back, this is like three snapshots, bring us back to, to Ella Baker very briefly at, in closing. And um, I want to um, 
uh, let's see how I want to say this. I want to uh, uh, mention the fact, as was mentioned by one of the students at the, uh, at the beginning, that of course, and of course is mentioned in, um, in Barbara's amazing book, that Ella Baker uh, headed the Puerto Rican Solidarity Committee uh, and in 1974 spoke before 20,000 people uh, in Madison Square Garden um, for the Puerto Rican Socialist Party's National Day of Solidarity. It's October 27th. Um, but check this out. So for our purposes, um, its founding document states, from the liberated capitals of Cambodia and South Vietnam to independent Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique to the worldwide recognition of the Palestine Liberation Organization as the official representation of the Palestinian people, imperialism suffers one setback after another. Uh, and by the way, most of the, the feminists who wrote actually sided with the PFLP, but that's another story. We can talk about that. Um, nevertheless, what I want to do in closing is hold up the brilliant work of a young scholar, Sara uh, Aratani, uh, whose doctoral dissertation is titled Solidarity's Liberation, Visions of Empire, Puerto Rico, Palestine, in the U.S. Imperial Project, 1967 and 1999. She did it at George Washington uh, University. And it examines these relationships, but I would argue through the radical lens bequeathed to us from Ella Baker. But with a focus on the campus of the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle. Yes, and you know that's Barbara's house, okay? <laughs> now check it out. And by the way, what I don't know is if she's related to Hisham Aratani, who was one of the three Palestinian Americans shot by a settler in Vermont, um, a student of Brown, but I'm not sure. I don't really know her, but her work is incredible. Um, and I want to give her credit because she reconstructs the history of solidarity between the Organization of Arab Students and the Union for Puerto Rican Students uh, on that campus going back to 1973. And UICC was a stronghold of Zionism. In 1968, Students for Israel was formed, which functioned as an information bureau for Israel on campus. Um, it celebrated the occupation. Um, the OAS protests uh, face repression for the administration, which of course is no surprise. Much of what we're seeing here was happening then. Um, and it's no surprise that the administration backed the Zionist student groups. So besides teach-ins and direct action, the pages of the student paper, the Chicago Illini, uh, for, became a forum for critique. And it ran frequent articles on Palestine, Israel, on the October War of 1973, critiquing ongoing US military support and questioning why the US left criticized US involvement in Vietnam but had nothing to say about US involvement in Israel. Right? She profiles uh, Marta Rodriguez, a Puerto Rican student, singer, and well-known activist who served as a primary link between the OAS and uh, the UPRS. And according to our, our Tani, um, her, quote, commitment to Palestinian liberation was so strong, she always wore a kafia in demonstrations of her solidarity on campus. Uh, through her and other Arab students, they began attending different meetings together, uh, UPRS and OAS students, and they built an alliance. And they worked together disrupting, for example, the 1978 Israeli Independence Day celebration for which the administration had those students arrested. Uh, and in response the, to the repression, student activists, especially Puerto Rican students, leaders, formed a short-lived Committee Against Student Repression, uh, which is an ad hoc organization to combat police repression. So um, it's, it's an amazing history, and I want to mention it because her work and everything I've been talking about is the kind of linchpin to connect present to past and to show that black women and women of color were at the forefront in Palestinian solidarity, as they still are. So I will end with Ella Baker's own words from that speech because they are relevant. She says, a nice gathering like today is not enough. You have to go back and reach out to your neighbors who don't speak to you. You have to reach out to your friends who think they're making it good and get them to understand that they, as well as you and I, 
cannot be free in America or anywhere else where there is capitalism and imperialism until we can get people to recognize that they themselves have to make the struggle and have to make the fight for freedom every day in the year, every year until they win it. Thank you. We go for getting this going. Dale Gore. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start the official count. Robin Kelly was my dissertation chair. <laughs> One. <laughs> um, and Barbara Ramsey has been an important and powerful mentor for me. Since in our ages both, I was a graduate student at Northwestern University. Um, and, and, um, but I would even say since her time uh, at Michigan when I was a student uh, budding activist or thinker in Detroit to see uh, and looking towards Michigan, other things happen. Um, so it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today um, to think with y'all, celebrate with y'all, organize with y'all, mourn with y'all, fight with y'all, um, and in the honor of uh, Ella Baker as a resident thinker and activist for the 21st century. Um, I see the kafias out there. I wear mine where I can because a student gave it to me. It's important to me for that. A student who does this work every day and carries the weight and still shows up. Um, so I, too, try to show up. Um, in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, and to make note wherever I go, the genocidal bombing of Gaza continues, resumes, and we continue to call for a ceasefire now. Like Rob and I look out and I see people from so many different walks of life. I think this is the the beauty of aging, maybe. I see people I went to grad school with, funders who were the cool funders, <laughs> which I hadn't known about. I see students who read Ella Baker with me and taught it in some of my first classes at UMass Amherst. I see my California folks who taught me how to have a good life. And then I came back to the East Coast. I see my new comrades um, as I try to make a home as an activist and a scholar in DC. And I see folks that I see in all walks of life, Robin everywhere I go, because he's carrying a bag and, and going to another meeting, but other people too. And I see those folks that I organize with daily through the Scholars for Social Justice, um, who uh, mean so much to me in, in this current moment to have such a, a committed group of scholars and activists come together. So it is a real pleasure. I want to take a moment to thank Pramila, Sarah, Jafari, everyone else who helped organize this to sort of put it together with such care and thoughtfulness um, in the midst of so much other labor that we're doing. I want to thank the students who emailed me and I never responded. <laughs> Sophie and Kelsey to help me figure out the logistics of giving, getting here. Um, uh, I eventually did respond because I'm here but uh, I want to acknowledge that labor as well. And the students who got up and spoke earlier for carrying on this fight, for taking it to the forefront, for doing it in the midst of trying to study and make it through these hard times. Um, so I, I just want to take a moment to, to acknowledge that. When I received the invitation, and I'm going to read, because I'm going to try to keep the time, because I can, um, we'll see how it goes. Um, when I received the invitation for the 20th anniversary of the publication of Barbara Ransby's Field Defining and Politically Prescient study of Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, I was a bit taken back that it had been 20 years. In some ways, the Ella Baker uh, book comes as one of those places that exceeds his publication timeline, right? I had heard about it as an activist and graduate student um, during the early 2000s. It was coming. I, see, I had the pleasure of, of seeing Barbara speak about it. And I continue to return to it as a scholar and a teacher. My introduce my students to it almost every year in my class on civil rights movement and black women in the civil rights movement. Um, and so it has a life that I was shocked to say, has it 
been only 20 years? Is it really been 20 years? I have to say that um, after reading the book the first time, I found myself returning to it again and again for the usable lessons it provides us as students of black women radicalism and the black radical tradition. Also as someone who was trying to carve out a space as a scholar and activist. Um, it provides a crucial historical recovery and analysis of Ella Baker's life of activism, and in doing so, reframes dominant understandings, um, at, particularly at the time of the contributions of lifelong activists, many leftists, to the civil rights movement. The book also uncovered the power and possibility of grassroots organizing and forced a rethinking of black leadership. In addition, the biography elevated Ella Baker as a historical figure. And more importantly, I think, it shines a spotlight on her philosophy of and theorizing for political change and organizing within the Black freedom struggle, which continues to circulate widely, providing an inspiring and instructional example, to paraphrase uh, Barbara Ransby, of, quote, what ordinary people acting together can do. Biographies and stories of singular figures have long been a dominant form in the studies of black women's activism and intellectual history. A lot we could talk about, a lot of that is about how we locate the archival records. Yet I think Ella Baker signaled an important shift in the form of black women's biography that uh, Pramila touched on earlier. In part, I think one of the things that really spoke to me about the piece was the way the book was the ways it emphasized the centrality of collective work, networks and your people to Baker's life. And Barbara Ramsey talks about how Baker often asks, who's your people? You have to know your people. And detailing the ways Ella Baker's life story cannot be fully understood as a narrative about the achievements of a singular individual, but was at its heart a life built through her engagements with others, whether as friends, allies, fellow travelers, or foes. I love that, you know, uh, Ella Baker threw shade and was like, you're not doing it right. It was important. And Barbara told us those stories. Ransby Ella Baker demonstrates the power of biography as a way to tell a broader story through an individual life. The book also made a significant intervention to scholarship on black women in the US left, which is the field I, offer, I work in. Describing Baker as, quote, a socialist without a party or party line, Ransby didn't shy away from Ella Baker's social investments, affiliations, and early connections, and the ways it informed her political choices and community. If you're a student of the left, she was involved with the Leftonites that included Pauli Murray, and they are a strange left formation, to say the least. Um, and we see that in the book. Um, Ramsey is clear, and Barbara Ramsey is clear in calling out when it led Baker to the wrong sides of history, such as her participation in the NAACP's anti communist policies and how it shaped her personal choices and theoretical insights. There's a great section in the book where Barbara explores why she ran on the Liberal Party ticket. If you're a student of the left, that's an interesting moment. But it also was a ticket that Polly Murray uh, ran on. So it created some space for black women who uh, were in New York at this time. But the book is equally attentive to not allowing Baker's socialist commitments to serve as the defining lens through which we understand all of Baker's political choices, organizational investments, or the entirety of her radical democratic vision so that we get to see a baker who espouses a socialist politics and expands a socialist politics. I know for myself and many other junior scholars writing black women's history at the time, and I see some of them in the field uh, of an audience, um, the book stood as a powerful argument for why these stories and these women matter. Ramsey's Ella Baker didn't simply fill a gap or add another name to the list of activists we should recognize as part of the black radical tradition. But it made clear that in studying Baker's life, we must think differently about what constitutes the Black radical tradition and the ways we understand and locate the archives of Black women's theorizing, organizing, and strategic leadership. Now, to be honest, on a more basic level, as a scholar that was just finishing my dissertation, to see that book, it win an award, it be uh, sort of celebrated in all different quarters, particularly in history, which has its own uh, issues. <laughs> it meant a lot to me in the sort of forms of representation. It felt nice and affirming to open a book for a first time about the left, about organizing, and see some of the names of the women I was studying. 
and feel like I knew that terrain. They weren't, I wasn't searching to find them. They were a part of the story. They weren't a footnote. They weren't a mention. They were central to the story. I think about figures that I study, such as Marvel Cook or Pauli Murray, Claudia Jones, Shirley Graham Du Bois. They became central in that story, and that felt meaningful to me at the time, and still, I think, is an important part of the work that it does. So in, in taking these lessons, I'm going to shift a little bit and try to talk a little bit about my current work and how these lessons that uh, Ella, we take from Ella Baker and I also take from Barbara Ransby's writing as a historian, um, how it continues to shape my work. Um, I want to sort of spend the rest of my time sketching the radical vision of internationalism that Audre Lorde came to embrace through her internationalist travels and transnational activism and use it as sort of a coda or maybe a way to think, chart intergenerational exchange or connection within the Black radical tradition. Um, and as a way to link Audre Lorde to the work of a broad network of Black women radicals within the Black left who played a crucial role in imagining and enacting a radical vision of Black internationalism during the post-World War II period of the late 1940s and 1950s. And in my larger work, which I argue, or maybe I'm just suggesting now, so it set the groundwork for a compelling third world solidarity politics that comes to dominate the US black radical and anti-colonial politics of the 60s and 70s. And that Lord articulates so beautiful in her writings and travel. I'll begin. In September of 1976, Audre Lorde visited the Soviet Union for two weeks at the invitation of the Union of Soviet Writers to participate in the Afro-Asian Writers Conference as an observer. Her trip will follow in the steps of a number of other Black leftists who had made the journey over the years, including lifelong communist Thelma Dale Perkins, who made her first trip to the Soviet Union just two years before Lord, and after more than 30 years of activism in New York's Black left and numerous Communist Party affiliated organizations. Dale's Perkins, Dale Perkins traveled to the country as part of an Afro-American delegation organized and led by longtime CP activist George Murphy Jr. In 17, 1973, Dale Perkins penned a first person account of her travels and impressions for the New World Review. It was titled, quote, A Letter to Paul Robeson on Our Visit to Mount Robeson. In the essay, Dale Perkins enumerated the delegation's goal as twofold. First, to visit the site of Mount Robeson, named after Paul Robeson, located in a mountain summit in the Western Tian Shan Mountains in the Republic of Kazakhstan. And second, to visit, quote, the Soviet citizens of African origin descendants of African slaves, unquote, in the mountains of South Georgia. The delegation would also stop in Moscow and Tashkent. The Soviet Union held a special place in Dale Perkins' radical international imaginings as, quote, the first socialist country of the world. She finally recalls, quote, instant identity upon meeting the Bazikazan families of African origin, quote, especially of the Soviet women with the four black women delegates, thus marking a connection at the nexus of African diasporic ties, womanhood, and communist politics. Audre Lorde arrived in Moscow with less personal and political investments and more undefined goals. If a singular structure, if a similar structure, structured and mediated travel agenda operated for her. She recounts her experiences and initial impressions in the essay, Notes from a Trip to Russia, which appeared at the open, as the opening piece in her 1984 collection, Sister Outsider. Drawing from her extensive journal entries, the essay charts Lord's first trip in the Soviet Union, first stop in the Soviet Union in Moscow. From Moscow, she traveled to Uzbekistan, one of the most diverse regions of the Soviet Union, and the host site of the Afro-Asian Conference, and then on to Tashkent, but not to the Russian village of African origins. Lord recounts her trip to Tashkent, noting that among conference attendees, quote, there were only four sisters and on the long plane ride shared a less than satisfying bonding period where she sat, quote, with three other African women and we exchanged chit chat for a half, five and a half hours about our respective children, about our old ex-men, all very, very hetero, et cetera, unquote. Yet Lord would experience moments of real connection and familiarity in Udesikistan. In her journal, she writes in detail about her surprise at the warm welcome the conference attendees received upon arriving at Tashkent, noting, I, quote, I, goddamn it, was pretty damn well surprised at the gesture, at the participation in it, and most of all, at my response to it, unquote. 
Her essay also reflects on her encounters with the man in Smart Ken and his incredulity that people in the U.S. die from the lack of health care. Lord attests, quote, it's things like that that keep me dreaming about Russia long after I've returned. The experiences and sights during her two weeks in Soviet Union had deep impact on Lord. Moved by what she described later in the essay as a hokey welcome, Lord notes an, an affection, if not the identity Dale claimed in meeting Soviet minorities and traveling to Tashkent, Tashkent. Observing that, quote, the people are very diverse and no matter what the shortcomings were, there is an enthusiasm about the people I met here. She argued, she wrote that she was, uh, I am impressed by the unity. She asserts in closing, I have no reason to believe Russia is a free country. I have no reason to believe Russia is a classless society. Russia does not even appear to be a strictly egalitarian society, but bread does cost a few kopecks, a loaf, of, a loaf, and everybody I saw seemed to have enough of it. Of course, I, do not, I did not see Siberia, nor a prison camp, nor a mental hospital, but the fact in a world where most people, certainly most black people, are on a bread concern level seems to me to be quite a lot. If you conquer the bread problems, that gives you at least a chance to look around at the others." Unquote. <laughs> Lord was not writing in celebratory or delusion vein of African-American leftists who went in search of common ground or political models of a communist nation, but more as a black internationalist looking for options and possibilities. However, it should be noted that Lord was active in the black left form formations in New York, including the intense organizing with the Committee to Free the Rosenbergs and the Harlem's Writer Guild, where she attended workshops in the late 1950s and published in its quarterly. She also published the more ex in the more explicitly left Freedom Ways Journal in the 1970s and was mentored in some part by black left artists. Moreover, Lord had numerous other international travels and lived experiences to draw from. Clearly, these experiences and radical sensibilities informed her thinking and writing regarding international solidarities, anti-colonial and anti-imperial politics, and the Soviet Union. In 1954, as a recent graduate of New York, New York's Hunter High School, Lord moved to Mexico City, going to Mexico being Lord's, quote, chief goal. Perhaps she was seeking, like other leftists of the time, such as Elizabeth Catlett, an alternative to the political landscape that dominated U.S. McCarthyism and that dominated the U.S through McCarthyism and anti-communism. She would spend a year there studying at the National University of Mexico and living in Cuernavaca. Mexico was the Lord's first, but not her last international trip. In the early 1970s, she visited West Africa, particularly Ghana with her family. Lord would return to the region in 1977, just a year after her trip to the Soviet Union to attend the second world black and African festival of arts and culture held in Lagos, Nigeria. Lord also visited Granada, her mother's home island, twice during a five-year span of revolutionary transformation. The Sister Outsiders collection also contains the essay, Granada Revisited, an Interim Report. Written and included in the final moments of publication, the essay provided a brief accounting of the negative impacts of the invasion and the US's pre, the US invasion of Granada and the US's previous antagonisms with the burgeoning Marxist-Leninist New Jewel movement and its establishment of the People's Revolutionary Government in 1979. Lord uses the piece to launch a searing critique of US, the US uh, October 25th, 1983 invasion and the quote, lies and distortions of secrecy surrounding the invasion. She also articulated a more explicit call for anti-imperialist solidarities writing, revolution, a nation decides for itself what it needs, how best to get it, Unquote. Five years after publication of Sister Outsider, Lord would rearticulate a radical solidarity politics that moves, moved effortlessly from the local to the global and relied on the, quote, shared goals and knowledge of differences. Speaking in May 1989 to the graduating class of Oberlin College, she urged, quote, we do not need to become each other in order to work together, but we do need to recognize each other, our differences as well as our sameness of our goal, not for altruism, for self-preservation, survival. <laughs> warning that, the, warning that the, the audience that, quote, 
Every day that you sit back in silent, you sit back silent, refusing to use your power, terrible things are being done in our name. The essay ranges in this discussion of the conditions that shaped life in the early 1980s and move, then moves on to the question of Palestine. Enumerating the military and economic aid that U.S. taxpayers fund as tacit and moral support towards the, quote, military occupation of the Palestinian people's homeland, unquote, and the detaining of thousands of Palestinians who resist, Lord concludes pressing, concludes that pressing, quote, for a peaceful solution in the Middle East and for recognition of the rights of the Palestinian people is not altruism, it is survival. Then Lord asserts, my sisters and brothers, I urge you to remember, while we battle the many faces of racism in our daily lives as African Americans, that we are part of the international community of people of color. And she poses a central question of her speech to the entire audience. Quote, how are we using the power we have? Or are we allowing our power to be used against them, our brothers and sisters, in, in struggle for their liberation? Unquote. And Mariam Kaba. I have a production of slides, so we are trying to figure out how to make that work. Thank you all. Um, if you're taking photos and videos, um, please don't take any of me. Um, any photo taken, I'm going to add 10 minutes to my remarks, and we'll be here <laughs> until Sunday. So thanks in advance for that. You can go forward and talk about this Facebook. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, these are really impossible acts to follow. Um, I just want to begin by saying that Robin Kelly was not my dissertation chair. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, good morning to everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I want to begin by stating up front that I'm in full solidarity with all of the students and the faculty and the staff at Columbia and at Barnard who are taking direct action against the ongoing genocide that Israel is committing against Palestinians. Um, Dr. King once said that one has an one has a responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Um, administration suppression of free speech and of free assembly are unjust, and those who are enacting the policies are fully aware of this. Shame on them for the, taking the actions that they have to disenroll and to suspend chapters of SJP and JVP. By, I really want to also share my unending praise for all of the groups on this campus um, and on both of these campuses that have taken the principled stance of refusing to be cowed and have extended their support and solidarity with these organizations. Care is solidarity made flesh and to me, demonstrating our solidarity for those who are oppressed, violated and suppressed is a moral imperative. So I add my voice to those of others who say to you all, keep pushing, keep fighting, and that we're with you until Palestine is free. So thank you so much for having me today, even after this. I'm sure Barnard will be happy to have me again in the future. Um, whatever. Um, this book that we're celebrating is one that I return to over and over again. I can't really express my gratitude to Barbara enough for creating such a transformative work of scholarship, but also a critical tool for political education that so many of us have benefited from over the past two decades. I'm so grateful to be really part of this celebration of this work and also of Barbara. Um, I shifted my travel plans because I wanted to be part of this. So Barbara, thank you so much for your work, for your example, um, and for all that you've done and continue to do for all of us. We love you. Thank you so much. So we learned from Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement that Baker spent many hours at the Harlem Branch Library. In fact, she helped to establish the first Negro history club there 
which met regularly to discuss historical and contemporary events that were relevant to Black people. The group regularly sponsored forums and other educational events for the Harlem community. Baker joined the library's Adult Education Committee in 1933, and she became an employee of the Harlem Branch Library in January of 1934, when she was hired to coordinate the Young People's Forum an educational and consciousness raising program for Harlem youth and young adults ages 16 to 26. So a block away um, to the west of the Harlem branch, Williana Burroughs had been fired in 1933 from her job as a teacher in the New York public schools. And on May 24th, 1933, Burroughs and a white public school teacher named Isidore Begun they marched into the New York City Public School Board meeting and protested the, quote, terrible conditions that existed in Harlem schools, including the failure of the city to provide free lunches to the children of the unemployed, unquote. As a result of their actions, both Burroughs and Begun were dismissed from their teaching positions. Burroughs explained, I was expelled from the New York school system, you know, for conduct unbecoming to a teacher. <laughs> I was angry, of course, but the expulsion was the usual cowardly punishment for radical activity. Prominent Black leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois, hundreds of public school teachers across New York City, and members of the Harlem Parents Association vociferously supported uh, Burroughs in her courageous actions. From 1933 to 1934, Burroughs ran something called the Harlem Workers' School, which was established by Black communist James Ford in 1933. The school was created to train Black workers in Marxist theory and revolutionary principles. And under Burroughs' leadership, the Harlem Workers' School offered seminars on Marxism, the history of the Negro in America, and related topics and featured lectures by prominent white and black CPUSA leaders. In an office in the same building as the Harlem Workers' School, Burroughs collaborated with communist organizer and intellectual Louise Thompson, who helped to form the Scottsboro Action Committee and served as its national executive secretary. On May 8, 1933, a couple of weeks before Burroughs' school board meeting protest, 31-year-old Louise Thompson stood before a crowd of over 4,000 marchers at Seton Park near the Washington Capitol. They were gathered to demand the acquittal and the release of the Scottsboro Boys. Nine black youth falsely accused of raping two white women on a train in Alabama in 1931. So from her office at 200 West 135th Street, Thompson and her small team of three to four young women fundraised, recruited marchers, organized transportation, and logistics. Their goal was to draw support not just from Harlem, but from the entire East Coast and also beyond. Their efforts succeeded beyond Thompson's greatest hopes. On May 6th, 135th Street was packed with protesters eager to set off to Washington, D.C. According to Thompson, Remembering the scene, she said, the streets, the whole block was just like a huge mass gathering itself. And people of every category were there. Old people, young people, mothers with babies in their arms, children. It was something else. I think it actually frightened me when I saw what was happening. On May 8th, the 4,000 to 5,000 protesters marched from northeastern DC to the White House. Protest signs demanded the release of the Scottsboro Nine, but also advocated the freedom, freedom for freedom for death row prisoner Yule Lee, for labor leader Tom Mooney, and for activist Angelo Herndon. When Thompson addressed those gathered, she declared that the march was quote unquote only the beginning. Another time will come, she said, when 500,000 and even a million marchers would march for civil rights and freedom in Washington, D.C. According to Louise's biographer, Keith Gilliard, the 1933 march was the first mass rally in Washington, D.C. As Thompson predicted, it would be followed 30 years later by the famous 1963 March on Washington 
in which Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech, and by the Million Man March later in 1995, both of which Louise Patterson lived to see. A couple of blocks away from where Thompson and other Scottsboro organizers are planning their mass mobilization, a young black woman who Louise Thompson would come to know and admire was studying nursing at Harlem Hospital on Lenox Avenue. Salaria Key arrived by way of Georgia and Ohio and immediately helped to lead a demonstration against the segregationist policies at Harlem Hospital with five other black female students nurses. Her activism continued when Italy conquered Ethiopia in 1935. Key worked with a group of black nurses at Harlem Hospital to raise funds for medical supplies and also an ambulance for Ethiopia. She later became, as historian Eric McDuffie has written, the most prominent black woman in the international campaign to defend Republican Spain. In November 1935, Ella Baker published her co-authored, widely cited essay, The Bronx Slave Market, in Crisis Magazine. A block away from the Harlem Branch Library, her friend and co-author, author Marvell Cook, was on the picket line, having been fired from the illustrious Black weekly newspaper, The Amsterdam News, for trying to unionize her workplace. Cook was the first woman journalist at The Amsterdam News. She co-organized the first local newspaper guild at a black newspaper. The anti-union worker fired her and the entire staff and Cook was jailed twice for picketing the paper in protest. Reflecting back on this experience, Cook said, it was not ladylike to don picket signs and march up and down. It thrilled me. <laughs> there you go, you know something about her maybe now. I never minded getting out there on the picket line, and I enjoyed going to jail, even though I know that the women's editor shivered at the thought. The 11-week lockout ended in December of 1935 when the paper was sold to new owners who rehired the entire staff and gave them a raise. The episode marked the first time in American history that Black workers were involved in a labor action against a Black employer, and the first time that Black workers won an official labor dispute. Ella Baker's lifelong friend, Polly Murray, was outside of the Amsterdam News picketing alongside Marvell Cook and Murray's good friend, Ted Poston, in October of 1935. Murray read in the New York Times that the reporters were striking. She asked her friend, Ted, how she could help, and he told her to get her ass over there and join the picket line. <laughs> Zora Neale Hurston showed up to show her support. And Murray's biographer, Rosalind Rosenberg, suggests that Ella Baker was likely there too. Murray had never taken part in an organized protest before. She wrote, for all of my bravado, deeply ingrained notions of respectability filled me with distress. In strength, you know, sorry, uh, yeah. It was one thing to ride freights anonymously or sleep in jails in strange towns where I was unknown. It was quite another to carry a picket sign in the heart of Harlem where many people knew me. I felt as if I had been asked to parade in public undressed and was extremely self-conscious when I first joined the line and faced a crowd of onlookers. Murray persisted through anxiety. She was arrested on the picket and returned to the line the very next day. In 1971, 36 years after winning a union, and 38 years after organizing the first mass demonstration in Washington, D.C., Marvell Cook and Louise Thompson Patterson would organize together as part of the national campaign to free Dr. Angela Davis. Yep. And of course, Ella Baker spoke out in favor of Dr. Davis's release from jail, too. Historically, radical black women have always been rooted in geographic and temporal contexts. They were socialist and communist. They were persecuted and resisted. They established lifelong friendships and formed meaningful comradeships. They hung out in the same cultural spaces. They learned from each other. They collaborated together. They understood that the work of liberation is a lifelong struggle. The tactics um, sorry, the tactics that they employed were varied. Journalism, political education, 
the law, unionization campaigns, mass protests, direct action, fundraising, anti-eviction campaigns, transnational solidarity work, and much, much more. What an amazing legacy from which we can and should build and learn. Thank you to everyone, many of you in this room who have excavated these histories for us. And today, especially, thank you to Barbara. Well, I think the morning is starting off well. I do want to say, um, well, first of all, because they're all organizers, we are on time. Um, <laughs> however, we're also missing Barbara Smith, so I want to send my love and support out to her. Um, and while I'm doing that, I also want to say how much we miss and send our love to Asha Ransby Sporn and to Lena O'Day. I can't be here. We actually have time for some questions. And so I believe we will have, I'm looking at the promo, we have a someone with a mic. Um, Ready? So, of course, you know we can keep talking up here, but I'm gonna get. I'm gonna look around and see if there's anyone who'd like to. I see a question right there at the back. You ready? Yes. You. Oh, everyone's got a kafia, so I can't figure out how to call on people. <laughs> yes, please begin. Oh, I thought you had a mic. You're not. No, I'm holding the mic. You're holding oh. it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. My mistake. My mistake. Uh, see a hand right there. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you all so, so much for your wisdom and your time today. Um, Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, just thank, thank, I have to say thank you. I want to express gratitude. My name is Kari. I'm a senior at Princeton University. Um, and I'm here because recently, um, you know, feeling and experiencing paradox is different from studying it. And over the past four years, um, I, I've been like troubled with a lot of intellectual confusion, you know, feeling myself in a space, Princeton University that seemed at odds with what I was learning. And now I feel it sinking into my bones. And I suppose my question is, as we honor the life and work of uh, Ella Baker and all these other um, activists, and we hear their messages of fighting constantly and every day, and we see all the diverse ways in which we did that. Um, you know, I, I'm a dancer, for example, right? And it, it, um, it seems very simple to me, the prospect of connecting with community, just going out and dancing and maybe not going to class for a couple of weeks while I'm mourning, you know? It seems rather simple that we should be able to shut it down for Palestine, not just in a protest, but throughout all the minutes of a day, for example. And we, when we say that we got each other, you know, and there are people of so many different talents who can sustain a community from within it. So uh, it, it hurts to feel like I've been missing that for so long. And I'm thankful again to be exposed to that. So I suppose my question is, uh, what wisdom can you share about how you brought fighting into every minute of your day? How you made it a simple thing to say no to capitalism, to productivity culture, to a toxic work environment, toxic school environment, and to say, no, I'm gonna center myself, I'm gonna center love, I'm gonna center the lessons and the wisdom that these people have been proving with their lives, and I'm gonna shut it down. It's like a question and an answer, I think, but. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I would just, I mean, that's beautiful. And, and I think that all of us 
Uh, I can't speak for everyone, but I think many of us have, have experienced the same thing. The one thing I would add, though, um, it's the pronoun um, uh, um, instead of I say we, like because so much of so much of what what you're talking about, uh, and Ella Baker says this, and 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 Barbara lives this. There's never an I. There's always a we, and when we struggle together and hold each other up. That's where the power is because universities are not intended to be spaces of liberation. We make it that way, you know? So that's in my answer. I think um, you already have the answer in your question from what you were kind of talking your way through it. And you got to the end of that, in my opinion. Um, there's no magic thing, otherwise we would all be already free and liberated, you know? There's no, there's just the work and there's just ongoing struggle. Um, I really like something that Renee Saucedo said many years ago that I read from her, which was that I struggle so others may rest and I rest knowing others will struggle. I don't... I don't think there's a shutting it down in the sense of like, we're all just gonna go away and do nothing and the world's not gonna move, right? Like it's why in part, it's kind of silly every time something happens and everybody screams general strike, you know? Because I think that's also a struggle. And we've just seen with, for example, the auto workers, the reason they could sustain that is because they had an $800 billion, they had an $800 billion strike fund. And, I, and so they could afford to give health care to all their members to stay out for as long as they could. They could afford to pay people's salaries while they were out. And I asked the question here, given the way that our society is structured in late, late stage capitalism, if we're to general strike, what happens with the gig workers? Who's gonna pay their rent? And there's, you know, we have to think, I think it's good to look back at things and say these things are helpful to have in our minds imaginary. And I think we have to live with the conditions we're in and organize for those conditions in order to be able to win. And so for me, it's kind of a little bit, I don't know, I, I'm constantly just being like, yeah, first we need more people. We need a lot more people. So in order to be able to rest, really rest. We need more people so that we can do what Renee suggests, which is to actually rest and know that other people have our backs for real in order to be able to continue to do this. So I think the bottom line is a consistent, always being in the community, always being with our communities. There aren't just, there isn't just one. And these are communities past and beyond our identities, for God's sakes. If you didn't learn that, could that be the one fucking thing you learn? You know, it like over the last just three years, like can we be clear on that? That an identity isn't a politic? And that if we can't like figure out how we're gonna work across difference, we're gonna be in hell for a long ass time. So just leave it there. feels like mic drop, but I'm seeing, I see a hand here. Wait, where was the first one? Yeah, hand, and then Satya, did you have your hand up? Yeah, okay, I see two, two and okay. Oh, you have the mic, so I'm gonna have to, okay. I have the mic. Hi, thank you all for being here and presenting to us. There's just so much to learn, and I'm really thrilled to be back here. I graduated from Columbia 20 years ago. Um, Hold the mic closer. Speak closer to the mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm so thrilled to be here in your presence, especially um, Mariam Kaba. If it wasn't for her on Twitter, I would never have become an abolitionist. So, <laughs> shout out to at Prison Culture. Um, but I'm here with my book, um, and I wanted to talk about specifically. Um, Ella Baker was someone who reached out to regular people, the little people, everyone um, in barbershops and things like that. And what do you find are those places today? I mean, we're a very diverse group here today, but this is not a barbershop. So where should we be organizing? 
uh, in the future. Thank you. So while you are thinking, I'm, I, we want to answer this, and then I just want to say, just from time, we're gonna. I'm gonna take a couple of questions, and then we'll we'll resolve. Okay, cool. yeah. We can we can answer this one, but then I'm gonna call another one. I'm. I guess I, I would say we start organizing where we are, um, and I think we only get. I, I love. I mean, ditto. Let's. <laughs> um, that we. It's not about proselytizing to people wherever we see them. It's about building solidarity with folks and then having people's backs as we struggle. We all struggle to make a life in this world. And I think we start organize. If you can't organize where you are, I don't think you're going to be able to organize the barbershop. <laughs> you know? And I, I would say that if you can't organize where you go every day, that doesn't mean they're your best buddies. That doesn't mean you have to be able to drink with them. But can you find people where you are who can have a shared goal, investment, resistance to your daily experiences in the workplace? Your, can you organize your classroom? I always tell my students in the class, if you can organize a collection to get a collective of people to build an argument, to get out of an assignment, power to the people. Because <laughs> I'm like, that skill is more important than anything else I can tell you. That skill to have people mobilize with you, not simply for their interests, but because they believe in, in sort of a larger solidarity, right, that might feel their interest later down, right? The students are like, well, I'll support you here. And let's think about, I believe you shouldn't have to do that assignment if you're having a hard time, and that's what it means for you. And so they negotiate all this in the classroom, and I, and I then say, if you can come to me with a nice proposal, because I think that's important. I think we have to build those skills. It's, I love the quote by Polly Murray, because it's awkward as fuck. Like, I'm sorry, excuse my life. But it is. Like, to be out at a rally and chanting, to go up to someone and be like, I mean, the left loves to sell a paper and it's annoying, but it does build a skill. <laughs> like, and so to me, I think those are the skills we have to learn, begin to build and, and start where we are, you know? I agree 100% with Dale's point, but I also want to say I find often, and this has been my experience just in life too, which is that it feels better sometimes to organize to other people because it's hard as hell to organize your own circle. A lot of people don't want to talk to their grandpa and their aunt. They want to get the fuck away from those people, right? And so it's like, I'm going to go over here across the universe and talk to these people. Like, it feels easier than to actually look in your own life. And because organizing is what? Relationships, that's your currency. And relationships are hard because people are messed up, <laughs> period. We are horrible to each other, we are, right? And we've got a lot of contradictions and we don't, we're never consistent. Our values, the gap between our values and our actions is a chasm, right? So we know this. And so that's part of the seduction of people always saying, where do we organize? Well, just you right here. We organize where you are. The whole point of, in part, what I was sharing was within a two block radius, people were organizing because they lived in the community. And Pauline Murray was right. It's really hard to organize in your own community where people know you because then they can find you <laughs> for good or for bad. Yeah. So I think that's a huge thing. It's like, you don't keep your head on a swivel all the time. It's not always great elsewhere. Sometimes you got to make it great where you are. And I think that is not something a lot of young people often want to hear me say, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And I think the best organizers who know how to organize their own community then can use those skills to organize more broadly. But it's not necessarily true the other way around. Okay. I've seen quite a few hands, and I want to see if I can guide the mic. We do not have time for every hand I have seen. I've seen this hand for quite some time. So in the white shirt here, if someone could give the mic. Hello, I'm Michaela. I'm an African-American studies major um, at Columbia. And thank you to everyone that's here, especially in your educating capacity. And I think that's what my question will be about. 
how is teaching a form of resistance? And speaking of the chasm between our values and our actions, the emails we're getting from Colombia's head honchos about this Israel-Palestine conflict are in direct juxtaposition with us wearing kafiyas and us standing for Palestine. So I guess what I'm wondering is how are you using your classrooms to champion the to be on the right side of history and to champion what the real human struggle is about and not worry about whether you're gonna have your paycheck or whether you're gonna be on the class directory next semester. Um, Sacha, uh, could one mic, Sacha, do you wanna, could you, uh, in the second row here? <clears throat> Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought the three talks were terrific, but I must confess that I was half listening to you and half still uh, processing the excitement I felt um, when the three students spoke. Um, so I'm going to ask you to address something that I'm still trying to process. There was a kind of a history in the making, it seemed to me, in what they were saying, one of the things they were saying, and that is that uh, these two student organizations were banned by uh, Columbia and Barnard, or Columbia rather. Um, but then so many other organizations came together, right? Um, part of it, you know, we could interpret as, oh, we are the world, you know, so it's like an emotion, it's a sentiment. But I think there's also strategy behind it. So as seasoned thinkers and organizers, could you say a little bit about how we can think strategically before a crisis emerges? to build these connections that would, in here and in other places, make organizations that are not directly affected, immediately affected, um, realize that solidarity is absolutely important. Strategically, not sentiment. Strategic, strategically, what, what would you recommend? Thank you. And um, Yes. Uh, my name is Swati. I'm a Barnard alum. Shout out to Speak, Students Promoting Empowerment Knowledge. I was also Professor Kelly's student. And uh, I teach eighth grade social studies in the Bronx. And I'm noticing that my students, thank you, shout out to my students, um, that their ability to organize and put together their collective power kind of stops at the end of the school day. And I think screen time is a big barrier for them. And as much as we learn about moments in history where people organize themselves, I think the students are having a hard time making that bridge outside of the classroom because they're hooked on their phones. And I was wondering if you guys have any advice for helping bridge that gap from the organizing of the past to today. Thank you. Though I hate to do it, I, we have a lot before us and we're running completely out of time. So I'd like to... Oh, Derek, where's Derek? It's, it's hard. Okay, okay, okay. It's hard to There's ignore like Derek. We know everybody in the room, though. Well, you, All right. but, okay. but you, right. you can't ahead, ignore Derek. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Derek. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this incredible gathering. Um, I have a very specific question that's related to some of the student questions that's come up. It would be wonderful if you all could contextualize the importance of being trained organizers and whether and how black feminists, black radical women didn't just show up one day and then decide to enter into a struggle and the importance of how to build relationships in, in, um, in parallel, what it also means to be trained and prepped for consequences. Because I think when I was a student organizer, I was like, oh, I'm about to get disciplined? Like, oh, I didn't know this. And then that throws our organizing into crisis, right? So could you talk about the importance of being prepared to organize and being prepared to face and tackle and be responsive to consequences, so then you can assess the risk about what you're willing to do for freedom. Thank you, Derricka, and thank you all of you who still have questions. We, I know there are a lot, and um, we have a, we have the rest of the day to enjoy each other. I, I'm just going to ask the panelists. Maybe you could just tackle one part of of some of that. We have a question around teaching, um, questions around um, what the student uh, leaders uh, set before us in terms of how we organize. Uh, and solidarity, and um, question from a local teacher in Bronx, and also a um, question from Derricka around the, how we organize. Do you want to go? Oh, I'll just say this to maybe string three. 
three of the questions together, because one of the things that I really draw from the Ella Baker book, from my own sort of experiences and from studying the black left, I don't know that people are only responding to crisis. I think crisis clarifies the choices you have to make and the side you're gonna be on. But I think the lesson, uh, I think in the book, um, or I should say this, one of the women I studied, Vicki Garvin, would always talk about the protracted struggle. And in the book, in Ella Baker, we could see the ways in which she is invested, I think Barbara has this quote, she wasn't invested in an organization, she was invested in building a movement, right? And I think that persistence, we say it all the time, is the key strategy to be able to respond to crisis. I would say par partly I've witnessed in this moment a real sort of amazing response to this war in part because people have been organizing around BDS. The Students uh, for Justice in Palestine have been organ organizing for a long time. That doesn't mean we have all, JVP has been organizing. We don't have all the answers to respond to all the crises, but the work that people have been able to do on a dime, right, is really there. And I just, the, uh, I'll say this other thing, we can save the clapping for that. Because I'll say this last thing that partly what I also witnessed was how many of those folks are people I've seen in other spaces, right? Whether they're students, whether they uh, former students, they're organizers, that they are moving in different spaces and willing to sort of carry out the work where it's needed. And because they have those networks and connections already, that's what they begin to build on. Um, so on the question of teaching as resistance, which I think is an excellent question, um, I can't answer it without acknowledging my dear sister, Farrah Griffin, who's here, right here, who's... <laughs> and, and lucky you. Lucky. And because Farrah knows what that means. We, when we were together, we were, we were causing a lot of trouble in Columbia in those days. Um, and what I want to say about it is that rather than, I mean, we could talk all day about various strategies that we use. Um, one thing that's important, which is tied to the question of strategy, is that we have to decide, again, whose side are we on? Um, and that's a decision that, especially for people who have tenure, should, it should be an easy decision, right? I mean, I don't even know why people, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but let me just say, the dark side of working in a university and dealing with questions of strategy, like right now, I'm at UCLA, we're forming, which is gonna be announced next week, our um, Faculty for Justice in Palestine. We're in the middle of doing that right now. Um, and part of what we're doing is fighting a whole lot of Zionist faculty who, who are actually not just doxing students, but they're going way beyond it. They're using the EDI process to basically com file complaints against students who claim, who they claim are harassing other students, right? So what we do, so in other words, most of the people at universities are not like us. We, we think, I mean, only, only, only the people who talk about cultural Marxism and those fascists, those are the ones who think so. But, but we're dealing with a lot of different kinds of pressure. So part of what we have to do working with our students, both as advisors of organizations, like many of us advise SJP, we try to give them advice. Like, why waste your time tearing down the, the, um, the hostage posters when, that, when there's bigger fish to fry, for example? I mean, these are things we could, on the other hand, and this goes back to the question, and it even goes back to the question that Derricka is raising. Um, and Du Bois said this, you know, um, he says, you know, nations and people have a right to fail. And part of what happens is that student organizers, all organizers have moments in which things don't work out. They learn a lesson, they fail, but that failure is not a permanent failure. It's part of the lesson. It's part of the, dis the discovery. And part of what our job is, is not to tell people what to do, but to be there when they fail, to basically when, when the storm comes, we gotta stand in the way and protect them and allow them to make mistakes because that's how we do things. We all make mistakes. So that includes the classroom. You know? So that's all I'm just gonna say about that because making mistakes is part of strategy and part of learning how to be an organizer. But of course, no one knows this better than Maram Kaba, so you should have the last word on this. <laughs> I just wanna say, um, first of all, 
of all, uh, what an immense, immense pleasure it's been to be part of this conversation. And thank you, Gina, for amazing moderation. And again, thanks to everybody who's here. I, I do want to say two things really quickly. One is, and this is helpful, I think, sometimes, that spending a lot of time doing something does give you some perspective sometimes. It does. Not all the time. And it doesn't always give you wisdom. But I remember going to my first um, Palestine Solidarity Rally when I was at McGill University in 1991. That's dating me. But yes, other people were there. Other people were in school earlier than that. But I'm just saying, for me, that was a moment, right, for when I went, so I went there. And I remember you could have thrown a rock and hit all the people that were there. It was not a lot of people there. Dr. Davis will speak to this because she's been talking about Palestine, you know, since before I was born, right? Like, so I think that that's not again dating Dr. Davis, but I'm just saying, <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So I'm just saying that like, we have to sometimes sit in the moment we are and look also beyond it to understand the context of this moment. The question that you asked about like, how are we going to get other, the fact that these organizations are this tight is not accidental. It's the years of work and relationship building and trust building that got them to this point where they could show solidarity and pull 80 groups together. That doesn't happen without work that's actually successful in building those relationships. When I was starting out on this work, there were no SJPs on any of the campuses. Now you go to Arkansas and they have fucking SJP chapters. <laughs> Seriously, because I got an email from an SJP young person through Twitter, DM, again, Twitter, where they asked me some questions. They're like, I'm from SJP Arkansas. Like, think about that, though. Deeply think about what that means, right? And so that's people's work and labor over this whole entire period. When you were losing your job left, right, and center, not, I'm not going to talk about what I've been going through lately, because I've been going through a lot of shit, okay, for an article I put out early on and a lot of other things. But I'm going to tell you that when you lost your job five years ago, it wasn't easy to look to, let's say, Palestine legal and get support right away. So the infrastructure that may be invisible to you when you're not in trouble exists now. And that is through the labor of a lot of people over time that got us to this point. So while things may appear to be dire on the surface, know that 10 years ago, it was even more dire. And the reason why we're, we have soft places to land today is because a lot of people worked. And so your job in this moment is to work and to do that, to struggle, right? And so that means that I'm going to say to Erica's point, yes, there are so many groups, Vision Win Change. Go look to them for security, digital activism, security training. Go, like there are groups that are doing this exact work right now. EFF will help you out. Like there are so many places. You need to ask, you need to reach out, you need to connect. But the infrastructure that has been built over the last 30 years is why we are here today, right now. We're 300,000 people. I was in DC, Derrica was in DC, Now was in DC recently, 300,000 people showed up. I stood there in tears, in absolute tears, because I could not believe how many people were out there from 1991 when we could throw the rock and hit everybody to 300,000 people of all different stripes in the streets screaming, free, free Palestine. Like, y'all, we have to be able to do many things at once. And while there are lots of bad things happening in the world, there's always, always also good things happening at the same time. And without you being able to see both of those things, you will not last. You will not be able to have a lifetime commitment to justice. So that's our work. Our work is to live in the contradictions of the moment but to not also ignore the shit that has gone on because the people who died before us, who worked before us, are why we are here today now. And somebody will be looking 30 years ago at the work you did and have that same exact feeling. That's the work, you know? So that's it. So leave here energized, leave here encouraged. Understand we've done a lot of things that are mistakes. Fanon talks about constructive failure as actually the seeds for the next thing. We need to have to, we're going to have lots of constructive failure. You're a fucking human being. You're fallible. But at the same time, we have built some stuff. So we're not, don't be afraid. You're not alone. 
You're absolutely not alone. Even when you're being targeted, you're not alone. So that's what I have to say. As folks are standing up, that is an acknowledgement that this is the best way to end this panel on black women in the black radical tradition. Um, I, I wanna, of course, thank the panelists. Um, this is just the beginning of what is going to be an amazing, amazing day. Uh, I wanna thank everyone in here um, because there's so much experience in this room and um, I, of course, want to send my um, love to Barbara sitting in front of me here. Um, I mean, only you could have brought together this group of people. Um, so, so it's now my task to tell you that it's time for lunch and that there'll be an approximately, we stole a couple of your minutes, but um, about 80 minutes of a break before the, um, the panel on teaching Ella Baker will begin at 1 p.m. So thank you all.